was just like any other day in my hometown that day when a crowd was seen in the distance joyfully coming our way as they entered the gates of the city the marketplace grew still soon we would see the prophecy we'd long awaited become real the center of attention was focused on one man when something amazing happened as he reached out his hand as he touched and healed a blind man we began to praise his name since jesus came to my hometown things have never been the same the blind now see the cripple walk the lepers are fully cleansed the deaf now hear the voiceless talk and i've been born again he said whatever we need we will receive if we ask for it in his name since jesus came to my hometown things have never been the same It was just a few months later when we received the news that Jesus had been crucified and laid in a now empty tomb. Then we remembered he said he'd die for our sins and after three days come out of the grave. For God sent him not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Since Jesus came to my hometown, things have never been the same. He said he is the way for abundant life is not found in fortune or fame. But forgiveness of sins and eternal life are found only in his name since jesus came to my hometown things have never been the same the blind now see the crippled walk the lepers are fully cleansed the deaf now hear the voiceless talk and i've been born again he said, whatever we need, we will receive if we ask for it in his name. Since Jesus came to my hometown, things have never been the same. Whatever we need, we will receive if we ask for it in his name. Since Jesus came, to my hometown I've never been the same I'm Bobby Mullins and I'm the executive director of back to the basics ministries and I want to welcome you to a fresh start TV program our logo is that at some time we all need a fresh start so we seek each week on our program to bring a message from the Word of God that will help you to deal with the fresh starts that we all need to make in life at some time. Now I do pastor a church and usually there I probably try to preach half hour sermons, sometimes a little longer on Sunday. We do about half that time, maybe just a little over on our program. So I don't have us look up every scripture reference that I use and you know sometimes I don't spend as much talking about one of the things I'm seeking to get across because that's not the purpose of this program. We just want to help to give you a little something that will help you in, in life. You know, there are just countless fresh starts that people have to make in life. I've had to make one, or not just one. I've had several to make in my own life, and the Word of God 
is the place as Christians we should go to that will show us how to do it the way God desires for us to do it. Now, there are people who get mad at the Lord. Lord, you didn't do this for me. When there is a prerequisite, a condition that needs to be in our life for God to work in our life. And I want to read a passage from the 15th chapter of Second Chronicles. Now, Asa was considered a good king. It seems like in the kings of Judah, that they would have a good godly king, then his son would come in and, and be ungodly and worldly, and then God would deal with them, punish them, then the next one you know, would be good, and, and on down the road like that. Asa was one of the good ones. But God uh, had to send a prophet to remind him at times, this is what you need to do. And so the Bible says, the Spirit of God came upon Asariah, the son of Oded, he was a prophet, and he went out to meet Asa and said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. Now, get this, the Lord is with you while you be with him. I've titled this tonight with those who are with him because that's the way we say things in modern language, but the King James Version Bible says, The Lord is with you while you be with him. And if you seek him, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. That's not very hard to understand. You want God to bless you? You want God to meet needs in your life? You've got to live for God. You've got to obey him. You've got to be with God. Now verse 3 is kind of a sad verse, but it says, Now for a long season Israel had been without the true God and without a teaching priest, and without law. But when they in their trouble did turn unto the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found of them. Folks, if you don't feel like God is working in your life right now, you ought to look at your own life and see where you're not doing things for God. The Lord will be with you. And that's not always the way that you want it. But friends, God says he will be with you while you be with him. Now, Tonight I thought about that. What is it to be with God? And this is not anything profound, but God will be with those who are with him when you're for what God is for, when you're against what God is against, and when you give God the glory in everything with thanksgiving that happens in your life. Now, this is one of those sermons that if I was preaching it at my church and we had more time, I would have them turn to a certain passage and we would do that together. And I hope that on this program and others that when something sparks your interest, take the time uh, on your own time then to, to study it deeper. But I looked at some of the things in the Bible and it says over in Haggai, chapter 1, verse 13, that God is with you. But it says what they needed to do for God to be with them. And I looked up the passages in the Bible that just simply had, God is with you. And these are some of the things that are a result of God is with you when this is in your life, when you're for what God is for. Number one, obedience to the word of God. If you love the Lord, you'll love his word and you'll live his word. And so... You know, we simply need to trust and obey God, and we trust and obey God by reading and heeding and living the Word of God. And so God is for obedience to His Word. I heard about some people who were kind of poor, and they were down on their luck, and they didn't go to church much. And so the pastor came by to visit them and try to be an encouragement to them. And he noticed as he looked in things at their house, that on the bottom shelf of a bookcase was a dusty Bible. So he knew they didn't use it much. And he made the statement to them. He says, you know, there is something that is a great treasure and of great worth in this home that if you discover it, it could very well turn your life around. Well, after he left, they looked and looked and they kept wondering. And just in the process of looking for things, they noticed that he had looked down toward that bottom of the uh, bookcase, and they took the Bible, dusted it off, and 
when they read about it, it had in the, the lining there about the word, of the, God, the word of God and how precious and valuable it is. And they knew that was the key. And they began reading the word of God. They began living it and realized what a treasure they had there. You're for what God is for when you obey, when you show obedience to the word of God. Secondly, you're for what God is for when you show reverence for the house of God and the worship of God. You see, there in Haggai, one of the reasons God had not been with them, and another great phrase in the Bible is consider this. When God says consider this, you ought to consider it. And God had told them in that day that they were more concerned about fixing their own homes and having the nicest homes possible they could live in to the neglect of the house of God where they worshiped. And so God wants to see reverence for his house, not only when we come to a place of worship. Now, folks, you can worship God just about anywhere. But it is nice when we come together as a church, we want a place of beauty, a place of, of comfort as much as we can, where people can worship. And let's not have our homes are in much better shape than our church where we worship and seek to give God our best when it comes to that. But it also talks about reverence for the house of God. My goodness, it's amazing what people do today when they come to church and sometimes it seems like there's just great disrespect instead of people realizing we're coming here to meet together as a family of faith and we need to revere and honor the Lord. A third characteristic of those who are with God and for what God is for is holiness in your walk with God. Oh my goodness, it seems like today the church has become so worldly that it's hard to tell the difference between the church and the world. I'm not saying be a holier than thou. Walk around like you're wearing a halo. But folks, to relate to the world today and try to reach the world, people aren't acting very holy and acting very respectful to the ways of God. You say, well, who are you to judge? I'm just based off what I read in the Word of God about what holiness is. And God said, didn't be ye worldly, to be a representative of me. He said, be ye holy as I am holy. And holiness is just seeking to be, to do, and to say things the way God would have you to. And how do you know that? Read the word of God. Obedience to the word of God. So holiness in your walk with God. You know, let me ask you this. What do you do for entertainment? What do you do for fun? Is it something that you might would be embarrassed to do with your church family or at church? Well, you might ought to find some different kind of recreation and fun. Another characteristic, if you're for what God is for, is steadfastness in your walk with God. Giving your best for God. It means to get out there every time you have the chance to do something for the Lord, to give it your best. I heard about Years ago, Gene Stallings was, the, was one of the coaches of these men when he was with the Dallas Cowboys under Tom Landry. And it was the football players, um, Cliff Harris and Charlie Waters. I believe they were defensive backs or defensive men. After a hard-fought game, they were in the locker room, and Gene Stallings tells the story about going over to these guys, and you could tell it had been a tough game, and they'd really... I mean, played as hard as they could. And they knew they had won, but the interesting thing, they said, by the way, what was the final score? You see, those guys, whether they had won or lost, they were going to give it their best. And that's how we ought to be as Christians. Just get out there, be steadfast, unmovable, consistently living for God. You're for what God is for also when there's completeness in the will of God. You know, there. There are only a few places in the Bible that says this is the will of God. It talks about to be filled with the Spirit. It talks about to restrain from sexual immorality. And then it also talks that God works in us both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Completeness in the will of God is to make sure you know that you're doing the will of God. Now, sometimes in my life, 
I haven't ever purposely tried to get out of God's will. I always want to seek to fulfill God's will, but I am thankful. Sometimes when I may have missed it, God <laughs> helps me to get back on track as I uh, obey his word as I show reverence for his house as I seek to be a holy person and steadfast in my walk with him. A sixth characteristic of being for what God is for is seriousness in your witness for God. Folks, that just means to realize that every day people are watching us. Let your light so shine before others that they'll see your good works and glorify God. People are watching you, and you're either going to shine as light in the darkness of the world, or you won't. Live consistently. Then a seventh characteristic of what God is for is joyfulness in the way of salvation. I want to tell you, folks, when you come to church, you ought to have a joyful heart. It says to come before him with gladness, with thanksgiving in your heart, praising God. And when we come together on the Lord's day, that's, that's the spirit that should be there. So God is with those who are with him when you're for what God is for. And we've talked about obedience to the word of God, reverence for the house of God and worship of God, holiness in your walk with God, steadfastness in your walk with God, completeness in the will of God, seriousness in your witness for God, and joyfulness in the way of salvation. You're for what God, God is for if he's with you, but you're against what God is against. Now, how do we know what God's against? Well, there's a few places it tells us specifically in the Bible. By the way, in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 18, it tells you what God hates. You ought to read that. I'm not going to read it tonight, but you ought to read it. But you know you're against what God is against when you're not doing what God is for. So let's just take the opposite of what I just shared of what God is for. You're against what God is against when there's disobedience to the Word of God. He's for obedience to the Word. You're against what God is against when there's irreverence for the house of God and the worship of God. I believe we're not seeing God's visitation sometimes in our services because of irreverence. Why, you know, we're coming to worship, but worship has become about us. What I want in worship instead of our focus being on God. You're against what God is against when there's worldliness in your walk with God. Some people want to keep one foot in the church and one foot in the world, and friends, that does not work. You appeal more to people in the world. You can lose your witness. I remember a fellow years ago, my past friend of mine, he picked up a guy, a hitchhiker. He had 100 miles to and from seminary every day, and he picked up this one guy, and that guy was in the Dallas area, and he started talking about, what all he had done the night before, been drinking, had been with women and all this partying that he had done and went on and on. And finally, he asked the guy who picked him up in the car. He said, by the way, what do you do for a living? And my friend said, I'm a Southern Baptist preacher. And he said, that guy looked at him and a smile came on his face and he held out his hand and said, put her there. I'm a Southern Baptist too. So you can tell folks that guy was worldly. But he was a Southern Baptist. No, friends, a Southern Baptist won't get you to heaven. But you've got to be saved, and a saved person is a new creation living for the Lord. Then you're against what God is against when there's half-heartedness in your work for God. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord when there's incompleteness in the will of God, when there's lukewarmness in your witness for God, when there's hardness toward the way of salvation. And we have people today who intentionally are opposing the Word of God. But friends, you've got to give it everything you've got You're, if you want God to be with you. You're for what God is for and against what God is against. And then you give God the glory in everything with thanksgiving that happens in your life. You know, the Bible says over in chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians, there in verse 18, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Even when things aren't going your way, you need to trust in God and give him the glory with thanksgiving and live for him. So friends, if you want God to be with you, you're going to be for what God is for, against what God is against, and give God the glory with thanksgiving and everything that happens in your life. And God says, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to 
work through, with you. If you're saved and you haven't been living for God, just recommit your heart, your life right now to God to live for Him. If you're not saved and you want to be saved, just trust in the Lord. Admit you're a sinner, that Jesus died for your sins. Commit to live for God and turn from your sins and live for Him from this point on. And you'll know what I mean when I close this program out by saying, Thanks be to you, O God, who gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
folks, did you know that we can now evangelize the world with what I have in my hand right here, this cell phone, live and on demand through the Creative Christian Network through which this program airs, A Fresh Start, and some other wonderful programs. So the information is there on the screen how you can make contact. And boy, I tell you, it's an exciting day how we can get the gospel message this way throughout the entire world. In addition to my service with Back to the Basics Ministries and the Fresh Start TV program, I'm also the pastor of Fellowship Baptist Church in Hernando, Mississippi, located at 625 Highway 51 South. We're about two miles north on Highway 51 of the town square in Hernando. Coming out of the Memphis area, North Mississippi, you get off at exit 284, Pleasant Hill, Nesbitt Road, North Hernando exit. Go to the four-way stop, Highway 51, turn left, and we're about two miles on the right in a two-story octagon-shaped building. About a half mile before you get to the church, you'll drive under Interstate 69. Our services are at 10.30 a.m. on Sunday and at 5.30 p.m. on Sunday evening. If you're visiting in the Memphis area, live in North Mississippi, or Hernando, come visit us at Fellowship Baptist Church.